My name is Marie Svoboda. I'm an associate conservator here at the J. Paul Getty Museum at the Villa. And uh, my specialty is antiquities, uh, conserving and working on ancient material in the collection. But I have a particular interest in studying the technology of these objects, how they were made and created, um, not only um, decorated, but just fabricated um, ceramics, stone. And, uh, and one of my particular interests are uh, Romano-Egyptian mummy portraits, of which the Getty has about 16 in our collection, um, exquisite portraits that uh, basically uh, range from the 1st to the 3rd century AD. Um, most of them are painted out in wooden panels. Uh, two of them are on textile. And they're quite fascinating because they talk about um, not only who the people were who lived in uh, Egypt during the time, the Romans, the Greeks, the, the multicultural mix of people living during this time. Um, they not only talks about their status based on the jewelry they wear, the clothing that they wear, but it also talks about the artists that created them mm. and who those artists were, the workshops that they worked in, where they got their materials, how they were produced, and um, one of our interests is being able to look at many of these portraits outside of our collection to begin to understand um, if there are hands of artists that we can identify and uh, workshops and to be able to understand the trade and use of materials and the production of it which is of great interest to me. Um, we were talking about pigments and the yes. use of colors on uh, these ancient um, artifacts not only on mummy portraits but also on um, sculptures, marble sculptures, and uh, even on vases. We see that on pieces in our collection such as the Kirch vase, which is a remarkable piece that uh, has post-fired paint applied on it. Mm. And it has a whole uh, beautiful color palette. So looking at the pigment palette that was used in antiquity is fascinating because you see a lot of materials used that would be sourced locally right. um, and those are a lot of basic materials such as the earth pigments, these are um, inorganic materials that were mined and uh, selected for their colors and clean purified ground and used for painting. But also we begin to see the use of organic pigments um, such as the dyes that we see used for textiles. Um, if mordants are added to the dyes, they can produce pigments or lake colors, and those are used also for painting, and we find a lot of matter used on marble sculptures, um, a lot of the pieces within our collection, um, and on the portraits, they're used for um, depicting garments, which is really interesting as we discussed that it's fascinating they would be using dyes to uh, show textile or garments on these portraits, but not using those same colorants for painting the background or the faces or right. other parts of the um, portrait. And uh, I find the production of these materials fascinating and I find their uh, approach to creating more colors than was available to them in their normal natural palette by mixing these colors. So um, if they wanted to create a purple, maybe to imitate the very valuable Tyrian purple, they would mix madder and indigo. If they wanted to produce a green, which you would think would be a very um, ubiquitous color, maybe an earth green or right. a copper-based green, um, which they could have um, even made by uh, corroding uh, copper metal. But we're finding a lot of mixtures to produce green, and those include orpiment and indigo mixed together. Um, that is a pigment that they use not only for mixing with the indigo to produce green, but they reserve that pigment specifically for painting jewelry and hmm. very um, delicate features on some of the portraits because um, orpiment has very um, large platelet-like crystals in its uh, in, in the particle size and um, those reflect light and they have a really beautiful quality to them okay. that are more shimmery than if you were to be using just yellow ochre. We have a wonderful example in our collection where there's a wreath that one of the uh, portrait sitters is wearing, a male portrait. He has a, a wreath of olive branches in his hair and um, it has the leaves and then it has little kind of yellow berries on it and the leaves are a mixture of indigo and orpiment to produce 
um, the green, mm. but the berries are painted with yellow ochre okay. because um, they probably could not get the intense yellow using just pure orpiment, right. so they could get a much purer, brighter yellow using yellow ochre. So you see that they're, they're not just using what was available, but they have the selection of pigments and colors for various purposes. They're really approaching it in a way that makes sense, that's practical, economical. Right. Um, and then, you know, for example, the differences we see in some of the production of these mummy portraits, um, and, and I'm sure with the quality of many other types of sculpture, is that uh, you're, you're commissioned or hired to create something. If right. you put a lot of money towards it, you're going to have a very good product. You're going to have imported wood from Northern Europe brought into Egypt. You're going to have the best pigments. You're going to oh, have yeah. gold, decoration. You're going to have all these elements that indicate that, you know, that's a higher economic status, you know, right. higher yeah. social status in their production and then those that are kind of more inferior not as good quality but still the desire to have these portraits produced or beautiful artifacts produced or mm -hmm. to be surrounded by these um, materials um, everybody had that desire and that was a sign of, of I think kind of uh, status and wealth but again you know you see the broad spectrum right of, uh, right like, like today I mean it's it's not very different Oh yeah, it was today. So. Yeah, and and I find kind of coming in from the end of of an artist and how an artist would have produced something is very is a very exciting direction because it it spans into uh, many other um, facets of antiquity like oh, yeah. imported materials, uh, production, workshops, um, chemistry, um, and uh, there's you know no end to the kind of discovery of. Mm. of of things that we can learn from them. So, right, right. Yeah. It seems like uh, now, uh, and again, this might be uh, more of a question for when you're finished. I wonder if the the cheaper portraits, the the ones where whoever's commissioning them has a lower budget, if you're going to see a lot more earth pigments in those and, and a lot fewer of the sort of more exotic right. yeah. pigments. No, I, I think we are seeing that for sure. Um, you know, you're, you're definitely seeing kind of not the high quality of, of materials being used. Um, but what's really interesting about kind of, and I, I even hate to call them lower quality, but kind of more of a uh, maybe a simplistic approach to mm -hmm. the, their production, is that the artist becomes a much more uh, more stylized. They have a better uh, identifying feature, signature to okay. their style of painting. So um, they have kind of a characteristic way of doing the eyes right. and the lips. So you are more able to find um, portraits that match that. Right. You, you begin to really see the hand of the artist in those that are more um, more caricature like yeah where the ones that are really high quality and fine they're they're such beautiful paintings that though you can make some comparisons they kind of have a uh, n not so many distinguishing features that help you I define or identify a particular artist it was a business they were making and producing these things for you know selling and for use and it wasn't it wasn't this precious one-off thing I think that it was you're looking at a really big business of mm -hmm. major production and, right um, and when you look at it that way and you think about it it really begins to kind of um, you feel a real connection to it because you can really uh, relate and understand that yeah and, yeah uh, that's that's one of those other I think sort of disconnects that students have, particularly with ancient through early modern art, is the idea of art having a function beyond right. simply being art for art's sake. Right. Exactly. You exactly. know, and I I think that's that's one of the things that makes art history sort of intimidating for the novice. Right. But then can ultimately be sort of reassuring in a way yeah, when course, when you finally connect to that idea right you know that it's a thing and it has a purpose that's right <laughs> uh, that's that's absolutely right it's it's fascinating yeah, yeah. 
Um, so what, uh, what sorts of earth pigments? Can you be a little bit more exact on some of the, well, some of the tones? And... Yeah, I mean, you know, we're finding, um, iron oxides. Right. So we're finding a lot of different tones ranging from yellows, a lot of browns and reds. Sometimes we find pure hematite, very, very pure hematite. Oh, wow. Um, but that's the biggest range that we see there. And actually, most of the paintings have a lot of earth tones. That's the, the what they're mostly composed of mm -hmm. as far as skin tones, background. Um, you can even get sort of a buff out of ochre. Yeah, yeah, can't you can you? Get it, right, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, they would have mixed them also with lead white or calcite colors um, to, um, to uh, um, be able to produce um, the tones that they wanted for creating them. So, right. Um, when you're looking under a microscope at a portrait, you can see all of these pigments mixed together to produce the flesh tone. Um, but also, you know, sometimes pure color, just to add kind of a highlight or a flesh on right. you know, detail. And it's, it's pretty amazing to oh, me. Oh, they're so rewarding yeah. when you really when examine you them up exactly. close. I remember going into that bummy portrait room at the Louvre and just oh, yeah. looking closely at just how sophisticated the brushwork is.